phase one was OPEC. This is a symbol for OPEC. Mm -hmm. And OPEC has, since 1970, said, we're going to use our economic weapon against the United States. They've embargoed us. That was one of the reasons for the formation of OPEC. Now, not all OPEC nations are bad, but this represents the oil producers, primarily in the Middle East. The Iranians, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, others. This represents the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. They did a study, and I contend that there was speculation in the market that drove the price of oil from $50 a barrel in January 2007 to $150 a barrel by June 2008. That's a tripling in price without any supply disruption. Historically, if they want to raise prices, they disrupt supplies. Mm -hmm. The new way is you saber rattle, threaten right. to close the Straits of Hormuz, and people get scared and they bid right. up the price of oil. I contend they also use the financial markets that they threw money, excess, that a trillion dollars went in from the Western economies to the Middle East when the price triples from 50, they make we're, a trillion we're, dollars more. We're OPEC has an incentive to see high prices. How I suggest they did it is part of what they did is they used the commodity futures markets. Okay. And I'm not the only one who says this. George Soros has said it. The chairman emeritus of uh, economics department at MIT. Everybody was saying it's speculators. It was speculation. Any way you slice it, you don't triple the price of oil. Without an event. Without an event and having supply go up mm -hmm. and demand go down. Right. So, and this is something that I laid out at the time. I, I, I think I marked, I think I may have said $140 per barrel is our tipping point. When, when it was going up, I said, you hit a sustained 130, 140 per barrel and you're going to see this economy come part of the seams. And that's what happened. Phase one was get people to put all of their money into energy instead of being able to pay for their house. Then you start to deteriorate with Fannie and Freddie and all the mortgages all go under, right? Right. That sets up phase two perfectly. Okay. How much time do we have here? Let's go to phase two. Okay. Go ahead. Phase two, and when I say that bear raids took place in the market, it's not just me who's saying it. George Soros said it. His op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. I've got his book over there, uh, What Happened to the Crash of 2008. Oh, no. A bear raid is essentially a run on the bank. And what they did was they panicked people regarding Lehman Brothers, right. Bear Stearns, and all of that. Fannie and Freddie, and I'm, we've got the Russian flag here, which is interesting. Fannie and Freddie were hurt because of phase one. Okay. People weren't able to pay their mortgages. Correct. Russia then dumped their Fannie and Freddie holdings on the market. They told the Chinese and, told Paul, uh, yep. and they told Paulson. So that is a serious problem that they're attacking, and that's creating all this environment of panic. The Muslim Brotherhood, by the way, created Sharia-compliant finance. Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the Brotherhood in, um, in the 1930s, I believe, yep. created Sharia-compliant finance and called it Jihad with Money. And what Sharia compliant finance was able to do was in October 2007, Wall Street Journal runs an article that says Islamic finance meets modern hedge funds. They were able to short sell using the techniques of George Soros because of this new ruling from the Sharia authorities. Which is not a coincidence. It's not at all a coincidence. Something we, we, we've never talked about this on the air, but America, I looked in when I was in, I lived in New Canaan, Connecticut, and that's all Wall Street. 80% of that town, maybe 90% of the town is all Wall Street. And um, so I knew a lot of people on Wall Street uh, when this thing happened. And I started looking into Sharia uh, compliant trading and everything else. There's something very dark, very, very dark going on there. And it's all, it's all undercover. I mean, nobody is talking about it. Nobody's investigating. Nobody's even looking at it. And it's extraordinarily dangerous. Well, and some of the Sharia experts that are able to rule what's compliant, what's right. non-compliant, right. they're jihadists. Yep. Their statements are absolute. Yep. We want jihad with money. Yep. One of them called yep. it. Okay. Qu quickly, let's run down the... R r okay. Down the well, I want to mention, this is the PLA who wrote the book, Unrestricted Warfare, I showed you yesterday. Right. They said a stock market crash using his techniques is the way to bring down America, and these guys have learned from that. Got it. Okay. NASDAQ was hacked. I mean, it was flat out hacked. And I was in talking to, to the FBI about this, and I said, this is a national security risk. And of course, the FBI, well, we can't confirm or deny is what they would tell me. But uh, I noticed two months later, the NSA was in looking at that. And if the NSA is looking at it publicly, it, it was said, if they're looking at it, it's probably an act yeah. of terrorism that's taking place. And we know Lehman Brothers was a target. George Soros said that Lehman Brothers was the linchpin that when they fell with Bear Stearns from naked short selling, that was, that was what triggered the collapse. Barclays is interesting because Barclays was picked to buy Lehman. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole long story that I get into the details in the book. I don't think we have time to get into it now. 
But they did not buy Lehman. They bought the Lehman assets out of bankruptcy. By the way, Barclays helped create with the Sharia authorities the Arbun transaction that allowed short selling. And Holy then cow. this was a target. They come in and buy them. Barclays at the time was heavily owned by two sovereign wealth funds out of the Middle East. Holy cow. Then they bought a Lehman Brothers. They bought them out of bankruptcy for a fraction. And then they sued later because they bought them so cheap that two months later in December 2008, Barclays had to write up the assets. Everybody else was writing everything down. Barclays was writing assets up in December 2008. Okay. We, we have such a short period of time. Let's go to, um, we know about AIG. Anything, just hit highlights here on anything that you feel is... AIG wrote the credit default swap insurance and almost went under. And if AIG had not paid out, Goldman Sachs would have gone under. Okay. So it almost... Phase three is, I believe... This the, is where we are now. This is where we are now. When this man was killed by SEAL Team 6, they found a document in his possession that was a strategy for destroying the economies of Europe. And it describes some of phase two, but phase three, wanting to ruin the sovereign credit of Greece, Italy, when, when just two years so ago. Specifically those countries? No, I don't know. I haven't seen the document. Okay, okay. It's all, all right. classified. I've right. only read the German press reports. But I know the Germans came out and banned naked short selling and naked credit default swaps. Because of that? I don't know, but okay. it's, the timeline fits. I also know that the Germans' um, spy agencies have reported financial terrorism activities, and it's not been picked up in the United States. It only States. makes sense. That's why they hit the World Trade Center. They, that, were, they were going after our symbol of power, our symbol of wealth, and they really thought that they could collapse the economy. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So the, the BRIC nations have seen the sovereign credit of the United States and seen the status of the dollar and the downgrade, and Brazil, Russia, India, and China have begun to trade in their own currency. If we lose the reserve status of the dollar, so our interest rates will spike. It's game over. Game we, over. Can, we can do that over 10 years. Yeah. If we do it over 10 days, we're finished. Okay. Investing in London is good for you, and opening London up to your investment is good for us. Now let me explain why, and then let me tell you about a few of the things we're doing to realize this vision for London as one of the great Islamic finance centers of the world. So first, investing here is good for you. Never again should a Muslim in Britain feel unable to go to university because they cannot get a, a student loan simply because of their religion. <laughs> Never again should a Muslim in Britain feel unable to go to start a business because they can't get a start-up loan simply because of their religion. The message is simple. The message, I believe, is very simple. Britain is a country ready to welcome your investment, a country that values your friendship, and a country that will never exclude anyone because of their race, their religion, their color, or their creed. But, but if investing in London is good for you, then opening up London to your investment is just as vital for our own success right here in Britain. We know we're in a global race for our economic future. So we're backing our businesses, seeking new markets, and banging the drum for Britain to show we're a first-class destination for trade and investment. Uh, 
happened. I want to talk to you a little bit about these bin Laden documents. There's a court case happening in Brooklyn this week. There's a terror suspect on trial. And that's why the world is getting its first look at some of these new bin Laden doc documents that were collected from his lair. And since we're talking about ISIS, last night I was reading through some of these documents. I saw a reference to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi in these letters to bin Laden. Um, our audience might recognize that name because he allegedly is the head of ISIS. But just a reminder, these documents were collected in the year, you know, or from the years prior to bin Laden's death. So this is what the letter says. It, it, it says this, we're going to ask for more information about Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. It goes on to say, we will continue our efforts for unity. Uh, hopefully this will be an opportunity to renew the unification. What, what does that mean to you, the fact that his name is mentioned in these letters and the reference to unity? Well, it means that uh, inside Al-Qaeda, there are branches, branches in Iraq, in Syria, across the uh, North African areas, all the way to Afghanistan. And sometimes these branches acted a little bit more autonomous than others. We know that for a fact in Iraq. So under bin Laden, and even after that under Zawahiri, they were always called to unify all these branches, making sure that the leaders, including this time uh, the name of al-Baghdadi was mentioned. But now ISIS is another organization. It is not anymore part of al-Qaeda. So this documentation should have been revealed back in 2011. And let me add one point. I don't understand how we are having access to these documents only because of legal cases. I mean, outside important <laughs> confidential information, these are general information. The U.S. public should have obtained them from the administration directly four years ago. Why do you think they haven't been released? Well, it's not uh, a secret anymore because it would have proved that al-Qaeda was much bigger much stronger than it was claimed in 2012 because of the electoral uh, situation. And number two, because it may have, I don't know, but it may have also shown the linkage between Al-Qaeda, not just with Iran, as you just said in the introduction, but with the Muslim Brotherhood hmm. and other organizations in North Africa. That would have been very problematic for the U.S. administration's policy. Well, several officials on the record that have talked about ISIS as a new threat, as something we haven't seen before. But from what you're saying, Waleed, is that there, the the footprints or the blueprints, I should say, of ISIS go directly to Al Qaeda and perhaps they were known entities all along. ISIS is nothing but a chunk from Al Qaeda which developed on its own and has a life of its own. Most of their commanders have been known according to local intelligence, not just US intelligence, Western intelligence, but Arab intelligence. These are commanders <laughs> who were in Al Qaeda. The other ones are jihadists recruited and indoctrinated by either Al-Qaeda or the other jihad. So it's the same crowd that has been modifying its own structure. Uh, the administration should have informed the American public about the possibility that an ISIS will grow. And now, even ISIS is acting, they may be a post-ISIS jihadi organization I just acting like you, in the world. I just like your, your final thoughts on this. Another section from the bin Laden documents talking about how to wage war on America. And it was very clear in this one particular segment. It said, you know, it doesn't matter. Essentially, it doesn't matter how many Americans you kill on foreign soil. We have to do something bigger. And here's what it says. One large operation inside America affects the security and nerves of 300 million Americans, whereas killing 1,000 soldiers during eight years or more has a weak effect on their mental strain as a whole. We've been focusing a lot while lead on lone wolf, small attacks. That's what we're told is, is the greatest threat. But what about this, this reference to a bigger operation because of its, its potential impact? This is the hallmarks of Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda, ISIS, others, they all want to harm America. They all want to defeat the national security of the United States. That is known. What Al-Qaeda leadership wanted to do is a massive other 9-11 operation which would have crumbled the psychological support to government. I don't think ISIS is different. ISIS could do anything, all of the above mentioned things, if they can, and they're trying hard. But there has been no third world war. But there has been no third world war.